And also, there would be displays of, of horse uh, wagons uh, for commercial purposes, but also ones for people to ride in. So carriage manufacturers would show their best. And, yes, Lisa? Well, there's a question, but I think we can pretty much say it's a fact that there was another type of carriage shown at the exposition. And that was with carriage. the Daimler company who were showing their horseless carriage. Mm -hmm. And so it's people kind of debate what exactly was shown what. The descriptions that they wrote perfectly describe what looks like an automobile. It sounds, sounds like, like an automobile. An, but it smelled like an automobile. What does it say, Lisa? Well, it talks about it being a um, petroleum operated vehicle with an open carriage and wheels and it sounds like a car. I'll leave it to the people who debate that one, but it's nice to speculate on. Now as we get close, Louis Sullivan had a lot of project in his office and he had a young assistant still in his 20s by the name of Frank Lloyd Wright. Also this will show you the golden door it wasn't just gold, there were multi-colors pushed into it. And the young Frank Lloyd Wright was responsible for detailing a lot of the ornamentation on the golden door. And when you see ones where you've got a really strong geometry and just a few leaves, that's characteristic of things that Wright probably did. And of course, as Wright developed his career, the geometry superseded the any this kind of organic or the organic spirit of the creation of the building was shared by Wright and by Sullivan. But this model, you can read the inscription. Yeah, we're kind of in a good spot to read that. I'm not sure if you folks can read it in the audience, but this quote says, there be three things which make a nation great and prosperous, a fertile soil, busy workshops, and easy conveyance for men and goods from place to place. That's nice. What's it say on the other side? On the other side, it says, of all invention, the alphabet and the printing press alone accepted those inventions which abridge distance have done most for civilization. I used to look at old photographs of this and there was kind of a little murky little letter. I didn't say so. This works out well. So now we're going to take a, another little trip as we leave the beautiful transportation building and we are going to set foot on the natural respite that was known as the wooded island. Now, it wasn't even originally an island, there was a lagoon. They cut away one side to make an island. Now, Frederick Law Olmsted hoped this would be a total natural environment. If he had his choice, he would have had all native plants, but he had to work with what was there. And to fill it in, he had to get some of the fastest growing weeds he could find to fill it up. The Park District of Chicago is probably still fighting those to this day. They brought truckloads and truckloads and truckloads of plants from the Lake Calumet. Now people wanted to put exhibits up there and folks that say, no, no, no. And there was this really pushy guy and he had a club called the Boone and Crockett Club. And he just insisted that he just drove them crazy. And finally they had to give him, all right, all right. And that pushy guy was a young man named Teddy Roosevelt. <laughs> and here was this hunter's cabin, which actually wound up becoming the man cave of the Columbian Exposition. Mm. And there are stories of the fair's planners, like Daniel Burnham. Once this thing was completed, they wanted to just have their own little manly get together. They would gather in here, and they would have their cigars and their brandy and talk over the events of the day. And amidst the foliage, some of which was there, over one of the bridges. And then you'll see this little tent-like white structure. You will see these in the vistas throughout Lisa's model. This was one of the Hygieia water stands. Now, one of the fears of the 19th century was the spread of disease by impure, unclean water. And there was even concern at the time of the fair with the number of visitors. If there was some kind of contamination with Chicago's municipal water system, which actually was fairly reliable, it was enough of a concern that they actually spread word that they had built a pipeline going to a natural spring in Wisconsin to bring water to the fair. Well, not true. But <laughs> they did bottle it and sell this pure. It was Hygieia. And you will see them throughout the fairgrounds as, as we go through.
But Lisa said they would recreate the signs exactly I'm not the sure way you they read them. But the one down here says, clear as a crystal, sparkling as a diamond, to preserve your health. While well, in the city, order a 10-gallon can of our pure spring water sent to your hotel or residence. Or Walk to Shaw. Walk to Shaw, Wisconsin. And when they talked about actually building that pipeline, of course, the people in Walk to Shaw was terrified of it. Drain their streams. It didn't happen. <laughs> Now, for all of Frederick Law Olmsted's hope for an actual environment, the World's Fair was still a commercial showcase for companies, including companies that made seeds and for the growing of flowers. And so sections of the wooded island were furnished with neatly trimmed lawns and displays by the different seed companies showing the varieties of uh, flowers that they had developed to be put on display. Here even you can see that in the modest uh, exhibit, here is a real Colombian exposition tool shed. Um, <laughs> I thought you were going to admire my plants. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not just to see how the big manufacturers building behind it kind of appears and disappears. This is part of the mystery and affair that made it special. Olmsted was very careful to plan it. Another thing Olmsted probably would not like to get around, but he actually changed the level of it so you wouldn't see it, uh, was there was a great popularity of growing roses. And so the, the, the companies that sold and distributed roses even developed special rose breeds for the fair with names like Columbus and Isabella, which aficionados of old rose types still grow today. So now we're going into the tendon, and again, you can see we're more in a natural environment that you might forget that you are amidst great classical buildings, but then you turn and get a surprise and find some majestic large-scale building just around the corner. And a good example of that would be if we just take a little turn to the west, this giant dome is essentially a great greenhouse, and this is the Horticultural Building. And it was designed by architect William LeBaron Jenny of Jenny and Mundy, who was the pioneer of the skyscraper. In there was many of the latest technologies, how to grow plants in greenhouse environments, artificial cultivation of simulating natural growing environments for foods, uh, all things that grow. So here we are on a nice little path with the trees. We're, we're at moped pace, I think, Tim. Yeah, <laughs> but, it's, but it's still a little, we have to, you know, get this, so we get this out of here in not five hours. And you see a flash of red coming up. And this is actually a building that Frederick Hall Olmsted was comfortable with landing on the uh, fairgrounds. And this is the Japanese pavilion called the Hohohet, the Phoenix Palace. And it is a reproduction of ensemble buildings as would be seen in Japan at the time of the World's Fair. And to create it, a workman, craftsmen were sent from Japan to build it from scratch using the technologies and the tools that you would have in Japan. And one of the people who probably saw this in process on his many visits to supervise the transportation building was Frank Lloyd Wright. And many people have cited this at the fair as being one of the influences that caused him to have Japanese architecture influence his own. Although, mm. interesting, Wright never mentions it himself in his voluminous uh, autobiographical uh, writings. There were artworks inside this building. Uh, one of the sad parts about this is the building was meant to stay there, and it did, until around the time of World War II, when two patriotic young men set it on fire and burned it. Oh. Um, I actually had somebody, when we were doing this presentation, asked if I would mind that they knew one of the kids that burned it down, could they bring him to the presentation? And I said, well, it's open to anybody who wants to go, but away from me. <laughs> hmm. So, you know, little rustic fences, I mean, so this kind of juxtaposition of the classic and the natural, and one of the great treasures of the building, both for its architecture and for what it stood for, 
is the women's building. Now, when they were mm -hmm. planning the fair, the men who were running the fair, they weren't giving much attention to women's roles in America. Mrs. Potter Palmer, the wife of and Bertha Honoré Palmer, wife of Potter Palmer, was having none of that. It was determined to build a oh, major wow. pavilion that would be about Rich. women in new professional role leadership roles and for things in architecture, in law. In fact, for architecture, a young architect graduate of MIT, Sophia Hayden, in her 20s, designed this building. And it was a building of beautiful detail, had a merry facade mural on the inside, and it was all about women's achievement in a new age. Now, for visiting the fair, you see that it's a really beautiful detail on the piece. When you visited the fair, of course, you would have your children. And what are you going to do with them? I don't know. <laughs> what are you going to do with them? You're going to park them at the children's building. Oh. It's like early daycare. <laughs> and everything you could imagine. So you could you know, park the kids there and go off and see the fair. Really pretty remarkable. So now this is probably one of the least attractive buildings that we have to have some pride for. Uh, the fair had buildings representing the different states of the Union. Illinois, as the host state, had to have, of course, the central most imposing building. Um, the architect, you have to kind of forgive him because it was getting up in years. He designed the old water tower, William W. Boynton. And um, inside the building, and many of the buildings that were representing states that had agriculture. And yes. Grain, Tim. Lots of grain. Lots, lots of grain. Lots of murals and exotic paintings fashioned out of corn and grain and wheat. Yeah, not just a little seed on display, no, but no. it into something else. So here in the Illinois building, a farm seed made of grain um, oh. in Kansas. Decorative geometric patterns all along the, the, the walls made of grain. Montana, a horse, sort of, made of grain. <laughs> Iowa, more grain. That's a lot of grain. And there's still the traditions of the, in, in Mitchell, South Dakota, in the, the corn palace. Is still done to this day and they renew it every year. Now there also is an international component which we are not going to visit into great detail for reasons of time, but to get a good sampling, this elegant building with the dome is Brazil. And this would be where uh, countries would show what they had in terms of their national culture and industry. And here we have the, what's now known as the Darrow Bridge, which still exists. And we'll take a look at how it's closed right, right now. What's that building? And Esther? then, I'm leading up to the, the great culmination of the view of the building you're in now, the artist building. Well, let's just take a little diversion first. And you know what? I mean, I'm getting a little sleepy and thirsty. Whoops, I can use a good cup of coffee. Well, we can stop, Tim, at the Guatemalan Coffee Hut. <laughs> and there it is. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's exotic stuff. There's a there were little of there were throughout the fairgrounds and in many of the buildings, there were different restaurants and cafes where you could get a true international sampling. So a little bit jumping across the water, you can see one end of an art building, which is the building you're in now. And off to the left, you will see a strange utilitarian wooden structure. That is the Intramural Railroad. And this was an elevated railroad train worked by a third rail system, the way our L train works today. And you could hop on at different vantage points. There were ten stations. Ten stations. Mm -hmm. And they didn't exactly tell you it was a loop. They did some of your stories of some people getting on this and figuring that in the, they're just going around in circles so they finally realize, oh, I saw that before. <laughs> um, but an interesting structure from the technology standpoint, you can see in between the wooden posts, the glass insulators that carry the wires, 
that powered the third rail. Yes, Lisa. Okay, Tim. CSI Chicago. Yes, that's true. In what, in the building. international version of, of the exception of the fair in the French building. The French were pioneers in developing the technologies of crime scene investigation. And in the French building at the World's Fair, this is a photograph of the model that show how to document the corpse of crime scene. Oh. Yeah. Hmm? And things like how to identify criminals and suspect for future reference, Based measuring their arms, and also something that is still commonplace today, the mugshot. Mm. Um, there's very little, I think, almost that today that you can encounter where it doesn't have some DNA on it in terms of things that were or either pioneered or invented there in its infancy. So we're riding the rails here for a little bit until we jump down to go to the state school. So these stood on what's the big grass lawn that you see on the north side of the Museum of Science and Industry. Here is the main building. Uh, and this building actually was, after the fair, taken apart. You can visit it at Golden Springs, Maine, if you happen to be there. Or a little Vermont next to it. They kind of complained about how they were dwarfed by the buildings on each side of it. It was supposed to look like the main marble. It was all plastic. It was painted to look like marble. I'm sorry. Vermont. Sorry, Vermont. Vermont. Yeah, Vermont's a and little tiny building, see? It's kind of a representation of an early preservation fight. This is a model on the famous John Hancock of Signature Bank, uh, this home, which is going to be demolished. And in the preservation fight, it was reincarnated. It wasn't the actual building, it's a reproduction change of his home. The state of New York, of course, they kind of were bummed out that they didn't get the fair. And they set this building claiming that it was part of a building that stood in New York like 100 years earlier and absolutely didn't, although it was designed by the great architects in Trinity and White in one of the great architectural showcases of the fair. And here you have Pennsylvania? the tower that Philadelphia. is the Pennsylvania building, yes, but the tower model on Independence Hall. And for the Colonial Exposition, a special guest appearance by the real Liberty Bell at the hall. You could visit us so at the Liberty Bell once stood not far from where you are right now. Mm. Yes. Butter, Tim. Butter. 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 Let's not belong overnight. Uh, butter. Butter. Wisconsin. This summer. I'm not it's talking about the building. It's 80 degrees, but at the Florida Pavilion, Carolyn Brooks, the famed American butter sculptress, <laughs> <laughs> was exhibiting her portraits of Isabella and Columbus. Wow. I wonder how they kept those in touch. Actually, that was butter. technology. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, that's the Missouri. Anyone here from Missouri? Looks like nobody will give up. Oh, we won't say anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> but one building we kind of like is this little building here, and this is Louisiana. And it also has a restaurant that you can go to. You know, by the time you get to this part of the fair, you're tired and you're hungry and you need something to really pep up your energy. And there's nothing like a nice plate of hot possum to get you going. Possum. <laughs> Mr. Possum. <laughs> They had Tabasco sauce. Tabasco sauce. Mm. Here's Minnesota, the statue of Minnehaha in the front, and we see coming up with the colony Nebraska, South Dakota. There's a little Hygieia stand. And every time we come back, Lisa creates a new building. And so we are happy to introduce, for the first time for your viewing pleasure, one of the great state buildings. Ta da! Washington State. <laughs> How do you like them logs? <laughs> and uh, also the stone entrance and a 200 foot flagpole made out of one log to show you. 238. Oh, pardon me. Sorry. Timber. Lots of Washington stuff. State. I 
Lots of wood up in Washington, remember? Okay, here's the insight. The buildings were contemporary buildings. Beautifully done. And as you look back along, the cathedral side. Little model of it. See it? Of local history and other aspects. And just like that model of Pullman, you're going to have a model of a farm from Washington that visitors can look at. So every state wanted to show off what they had. Now, one of the things that Lisa does is if she does not have evidence of what was at, like there's no photograph or a document in the drawing, she leaves it blank. And one of the sad parts here is Lisa's California. And so this isn't finished. But no, I challenge. No, you. you're not ringing the bell, Tim. This is my bell. This is mine. <laughs> All right. I want to see what California had to give to the fair, okay? Fine. Well, Fine. I challenge you. The challenge accepted. <laughs> California was represented very well, thank you very much, at the fair. So we had our own California day, complete with a Liberty Bell made of citrus. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Liberty Bell made out of oranges. In the forestry building, we had a mammoth, a redwood plant. How big a plant was it? And it was huge. It was huge. No, it was huge. Oh. Whoa. It was 16, and a half, 16 feet 5 inches wide, 12 feet 9 inches tall, and 5 inches thick. Okay, that's a okay. big, that's that's a big plant. I'll give you that one. All right. We had, in agriculture, very large gourds. <laughs> that's, that's a large gourd. We had more citrus in horticulture, so there's in San Diego County, a, an exhibit of a, a corn of plenty of citrus. Oh, um, that smells good. I wonder what citrus. Is. We had also in horticulture a hollowed out tree for an exhibit of California wines. Oh, I thought you were going to say the key for elves. No, um, <laughs> <laughs> no but this is, this is the beginning of the California wine industry. California wine industry. We also had a tower of oranges in the horticulture building. Wasn't there a special attraction to this? Well, yeah, because if you could guess the number of oranges that it took to build the tower, they would give you a box of oranges to take home. Very nice. And we have oh. another hollowed out log, this time in the government building. So the big tree from California in the center of the room of the government building. And it was 30 feet from a giant sequoia that had died of its own challenges. We did not kill it to take it to the fair. Um, but it was 300 feet tall when it was still standing, 26 feet in diameter with a circumference of 81 and a half feet. You can see by the scale of the benches around it, just the size, just the idea how it got here. Um, okay. I can't even imagine. But in the California building, I think some of my favorite exhibits were there, including the knight on horseback made out of prunes. <laughs> <laughs> and from Los Angeles, Los Angeles County, an elephant made out of walnuts. Hmm? Wow. Well, I think your statement is very nice. And now we'll take a little meander over and we're going to visit the building that you are sitting in now, the arts building. Now this was a building that the different countries of the world and, and throughout America provided rare original artworks for display. And so to make the place fireproof and safe, it was made out of brick and then covered on the outside with the thin layer of, of the stamp stuck up and also iron roofs. The architect was the mysterious Mr. Charles E. Atwood, chief designer for Daniel Burnham in the fair. And when I say mysterious, there were rumors of he died not long after the fair. And there were whispered rumors of him having two wives. And also wives of possibly to use opium in. So the person might have been fine for the Columbia Guard of it. And the place that we are sitting in now would have been in this pavilion that you see to the left. Now the whole building was redone on the interior in the late 1920s and the early 30s. So, None of what you see here dates from the fair. 
But to give you an idea of what it's like, you're going to enter this plastic portico to enter the interior of the art building where art from around the world was displayed. And you can see by the list here the different companies, the countries that are represented by the colors where you would get an international uh, sampling mm -hmm. of art around the world. So on the diagram, the pink is the United States, the blue in the lower right is England, the green in the upper left is Germany, and so on. So you could get that sampling of art from around the world. So here's an example of the Japanese section and the Holland section. And also for the um, American artists, and so Winslow Homer is on display, and John Singer Sargent, among many prominent artists. But all was on equal ground to be seen in conjunction. So you're really, it was truly global in terms of your experience. It's like very unusual. Why don't you kind of a chest thumping thing about any kind of American uh, running the whole show? So through the classical portico, and you will see how Atwood very masterfully blended classical design with the fluted columns to the technology of the 19th century. So you'll see exposed metal trusses, simplified classical detailing. The roofs were all made out of glass. You put canvases on them to adjust it. Superimposed here, you can see what this same view looked like when it had the art displays in it. And between the columns were the different, like most like booth areas that would have art of different countries or different themes. So you could walk from one to the other and sample and compare. And this will give you a sense of what it was like moving through it in three dimensions. How the space is shift. This is something that you'll never get from any photograph that you would look at. Here is the statuary that would be put, it is put in the middle of the spaces. And some by Chicago's great artist, Lorena Taft, also created much of the architectural ornamentation on the buildings itself. And here's another view, a close-up, just to give you an idea of the context of what was in this building. Going through these columns here, we are into the central rotunda. And those who are familiar with the Museum of Science and Industry and entering here, there is a great central dome rotunda. This is what it would look like in 1893. It is now a very simplified Art Moderne style, but at the time of the fair, it was all intricately decorated and painted murals. Here's what it looks like today. Uh, and even up to the top was a skylight bring light into the center. There once was a statue in 1893 on the skylight. Tim, what happened to that? And I think something happened to it. I think there was a structural problem, <coughs> and it was. disappeared really early. Now, you'll see the names of the artists that are going around the bottom of the dome. There's some gaps in it, because Lisa couldn't find views that showed those names. And we have invited people at this presentation over the past 10 years if they think they have views we haven't seen, and picked up like five names. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. And if you, you have any views that might give me some more, let me know. Maybe we'll fill that up. Wow. And so now here's another view kind of looking up from the top, the vantage point from the top of one of those galleries. Um, and then passing through the rotunda again, of course, you probably couldn't do that maneuver in 1893. <laughs> they did not have a zip line that went through. <laughs> so, so this is Lisa as drone. <laughs> and here it was a gallery that was devoted, in many cases, to architectural castings. In fact, many museums in America were commissioning people to go to Europe and make molds of doorways and architectural details mm. of architecturally significant buildings of the past. They were called squeezes, so they were called getting a squeeze. They would make a casting of them. Here they are on display at the Century of Progress, and some of these are Century actually still exist. World Columbian Exposition, Tim? Yes. You said Century of Progress. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. It's been a while. Yeah. Um, 
the, uh, at the Brooks Club Exposition, you would see these on display in what would be the eastern end of the building. And the same, now, most of the buildings disappeared right after the fair. And this one did not because it had a sturdy core of brick. Now, the exterior skin was a thin skin of plaster, but it still had iron roofs that were sturdy, skylights. And Marshall Field, the Marshall Field department store, actually went and gave the money to preserve the building and save many of the World's Fair exhibits showing the natural history. And this became the first home of what is now the Field Museum. Here mm -hmm. you can see that same space where the architectural squeezes were as the early exhibits of uh, the Field, what was called then the Field Columbian Museum. But the building really wasn't designed to last. The skylight started to leak. The plaster started to peel off the red wall. You don't want to get the stuff that we were left from the <laughs> Eddie Rose. The Field Museum built its new headquarters down in Roosevelt Road and Lakeshore Drive. And in the early 20s, the zebras and the exhibits move out for the new building. And what happens to this masterpiece? But this is a building that many considered the great building of the fair. And it was basically abandoned. And in the 1920s, the doors were wide open, the plaster was falling, people would go and come to Jackson Park to walk through this haunting ruin of a building that was actually falling into the decay and ruins similar to the Grecian ruins that inspired its construction. Um, there was architects who had a great banquet in the <laughs> building, advocating that it should be saved, one of the earliest uh, examples of architectural preservation in Chicago. Here we're turning around and looking at this, the statue of Minerva. And also, you see there, this was the one that had lions in front. How oh, bad was disaster. it? This is what oh. it really looked like. The columns were just made out of wood of this uh, staff plaster. But even the, the actual bearing walls of brick, big chunks of the staff of the trees and thaw over the winters of this large, abandoned, unheated building were just tumbling down. And it was a tragic sight to see. And as time went on in the 1920s, it looked like there was no hope for this building whatsoever. Because time was quickly running out. So we get some glimpses here. Here's the old skylit roofs that you saw from the inside. And I mean, truly, the forces of nature were working against it. But to the rescue! Ta da! Let's hear it for Mr. Julius Rosenwald. Sears Robot. Sears Robot. He's one of those Sears. He called Rosenwald goes to Munich. He sees an industrial museum. He thought, this is really great. Chicago should have one of those. He goes and he says, 